Very good. That was the perfect song. And I believe it's the word of the Lord for us this year that he crowns the year with goodness. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise God. I believe the promise to God for us in 2023 is one word. I believe the promise is better. God's going to do something better for you in the year 2023. I also believe that he's going to make you better. It's going to be a better you in the year 2023. And I accept that with, uh, with, no, with, no, with no resistance at all. I believe that's the promise of God. You know, it's very rare that we have New Year's Day on a Sunday. And uh, that makes this year special. It makes 2023 special that New Year's Day is on a Sunday. And the first day of the year, we're in the house of God. Uh, and I praise God for that. I believe God is speaking to us. I believe it's a special year for us all. Um, uh, I'm grateful for all of you who are here uh, on New Year's Day. I, I say a, um, a special uh, blessing and a salute to Deacons Overstreet. Uh, God bless you. It's been a while. Frank and Diane, it's good to see you today. Sister Joy, of course, God bless you. Uh -huh. And everybody else in the house of God today. Amen. You know, if you were here last night, uh, we're going to pick up from there. If you were not here last night, God still has a blessing for you that he wants to give you. Um, I believe that God wants to uh, build on what he spoke to us last night about. And um, the Lord anointed us last night. He anointed us with a new anointing for the year 2023. And um, I was, um, I was uh, pleased with it. I, I, I was grateful that God moved upon our hearts. I, I was grateful that all of us were anointed for the year 2023. There's something about the anointing. And, and you ever just try to describe the anointing? You know, what is the anointing? I, I remember just as I was preparing, I was trying to describe the anointing. So, you know, I went to see how others would describe the anointing. You know, how would the commentaries uh, uh, describe the anointing? How would other preachers describe the anointing? But I believe God said... Well, how do you um, explain and define the anointing? Like sometimes, you know, you know, we're just lazy in ourselves. And why don't you just take a little effort and think, what does the anointing mean to you? And I wrote a few things down. There's something about the anointing of God. It's absolutely supernatural. It is not of this earth. What I've written down is this. The anointing, first of all, is never cheap. Amen. It is indispensable. It is never too much, and it is never enough. The anointing from heaven will always be very necessary. It will always be needed. It will always be sweet in its operation and always produce tangible results. Today I want to read a story in the book of Daniel. Brother Keith, I don't know if you're able to do Daniel chapter 1 for us, the NIV. I want to read to you Daniel chapter 1. And, and Daniel will speak to us about the anointing. You see, the anointing, it is more powerful and effective than the skill that you could develop as a human being. It is more powerful than, than education. It is more powerful and effective than charisma. It is wiser than the mind of man. It is stronger than the strongest man. It is more influential than presidents and kings. It is the anointing. And this is what God has placed upon our lives. It cannot be obtained by any efforts of man. You can't buy it with your gold and your silver, but you can buy it with your hearts. <laughs> you can sell all that you have to get it though. Amen. You can turn your back and turn, turn away from the things of this world because you see something of greater value. And it is the anointing and it's this precious gift that God gives to you and I. It is the glory of God. It is the power of God made manifest huh, in a human being that we can show forth who God is. If you have your Bibles, if not, if you'd like to read with us, let's go to the first chapter of the book of Daniel. And let's read this short story here. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. Let's read this story here. It's about Daniel, of course. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. 
interesting, it says, the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylon and put it in his treasure house of his God. You would think, why would God allow this to happen? If our God is the true God, why would he, would he allow another God to seemingly conquer him? Interesting, isn't it? It says, then the king ordered Asphanaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah. Can you read those names? Are you familiar with these guys? They were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You might know them by their other names, which was given to them, right? Verse 7 says, the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. So let's pause for a second. We have Daniel. You ever hear Daniel? Shadrach, Meshach, <laughs> and Abednego. Yes, we are telling the story of these four young men on the first day of the new year. God allowed the king of Babylon to conquer his holy nation, Israel. It was baffling. All of the prophets of Israel would speak to the kings and said, Babylon will not conquer you. They cannot. We are the people of God. Who can conquer God, right? And all the prophets would go to the kings and say, fear not, for you shall destroy the Babylonians. But there was always one or two faithful prophets that would go and tell the king, uh, uh, excuse me, king, you're not going to win. You're going to be defeated. Their false gods are going to seemingly conquer our true God. Who could believe such a thing? Could you? No. No. In our Christianity and our religion, we serve the true and living God. Nothing can conquer him. What happened? No one believed that this could ever happen. There's a saying that says, um, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. God says, I'm going to do something in your day. If it was told you, you'd never believe it. And this is what was going to happen. A foreign nation was going to conquer the nation of God. Since the birth of the nation Israel with Moses and Joshua and, and then the kings, you know, King Saul, no one had ever conquered them. And here with King Jehoiakim, the prophets come and say, you're going to be conquered. Nobody could believe it. But do you believe God was at work? Because God is bigger than our minds. He's bigger, he's bigger than our Christianity and our religion. In our Christianity and our religion, we believe we'll never be conquered. We believe it's not the will of God to be conquered. It's not the will of God to be sick. It's not the will of God to die. Well, then you are all out of the will of God. <laughs> Because you are all sick and dying. <laughs> and I he even hear an amen from the other side. Amen. Isn't that interesting? Yes, it is. God works in mysterious ways. God is working in a mysterious way right now. And King Nebuchadnezzar, he says, um, bring me the finest of uh, the Israelites and these four young men. Some say they were teenagers. 14, 15, 16 years old, and they were to serve in the court for three years. Okay, let's go on. Verse 8, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Remember the story? So he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. You know, the king wanted to, to, to the guys to be strong. He wanted them to eat meat and drink wine and, and exercise and learn. But Daniel says, I'm not going to defile myself. And what he said, he said, just, just give us vegetables and water. Vegetables and water. So, so it says here, it says that 
Now, God caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, he said, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would have my head because of you. This guy was afraid. I'm not serving you nothing but the best. But Daniel insisted. Daniel said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He said, please test your servants for 10 days and give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Pause. I don't know about you, but me on a New Year's Day, January 1st, I am tempted for 10 days to eat nothing but vegetables and water to see how I fare. <laughs> because there's something inside of us that responds to the word of God. We believe in it and we want to prove it to be true. Amen? Amen. Just saying in case anybody wants to eat vegetables for 10 days. <laughs> But that's not the point, you know that. So he said, then compare us and our appearance with the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance to what you see. So he agreed and he tested them for 10 days. All right. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier. I don't know, guys. <laughs> How there's our word and better. Better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. All right. This is really not a, 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 a sermon on, on vegetables and water, just so you know. I'll probably have some cake this afternoon after my dinner. So this is not a sermon on vegetables and water. <laughs> All right. Hmm. Verse 16. So the guard took away their choice food because they, 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 they proved themselves. Took away their cho choice food and wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Then these four young men, it says that God gave knowledge and understanding. You ever pray for those things? He gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. Interesting. God gave it to them. God will make you wiser and better. God will. You believe that? I believe that. I believe that. I believe the ways of God are greater than the ways of the world. I believe that God will make you wiser than everyone that comes out of the universities. I believe that. I believe it. God made them wiser than all of the Babylonians. They could understand all of the mysteries of heaven and earth because God is the creator of heaven and earth. Amen. It says that, that, that even Daniel, you remember Daniel's special gift? He could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Remember Daniel would go and tell the king the interpretation of his dreams? Amazing. Amazing. At the end of the time set by the king, it was three years, right? The chief official presented them to King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar had to be a smart guy himself. He had to be a wise man. He had to be learned. Otherwise, how could he test them, right? You know, Nebuchadnezzar even would label himself before he met the Lord. He would label himself as king of kings. He would say, I have conquered all of this by my wisdom and my strength and my might. Remember that? He said in his folly, but he was a wise man. And the king talked with them and he found none equal to who? Daniel. He had these four guys. None equal to Daniel. What's their names? Hananiah, Hananiah Mishael, and Desaria. Notice they are all names of God because they were servants of God. El is the name Elohim. And I, I, the I-A-H, that's also the name of one who serves Yahweh. They were all servants of God. Take note of that. They were all servants of God. So it says that they entered the king's service. It says, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them to be 10 times better. Oh, my goodness. Yes, indeed. He found them to be 10 times better than all of the magicians, enchanters in his whole kingdom. You serve the Lord. 
You study God. You seek him. Ha. He will make you ten times better, wiser than this world. You got to go to the university of God, though. You got to seek him and find him. Amen. Amen. For he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, I speak to this to everyone in the room, especially to the young ones in the room. But since I was a young boy, I believed that and I would study God. I believe that God would make you wiser than the world could make you. Study God. Seek God. Only God knows the mysteries of heaven and earth. Only God can reveal them to you. And he, he's looking for somebody. <sighs> he is looking for somebody to come to his school, to his class, to his university. Come reason with me. He says, I will give you, I will teach you, just come. But we're chasing the wind, the four corners of the earth. And he says, will you come to me? I will teach you and show you the mysteries of heaven and earth. Daniel said, I will come. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I will come. It says they were 10 times better than all of the magicians of Nebuchadnezzar. Interesting. That last verse there, 21, what does it say? It says, Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. You know, they were in captivity for 70 years. So Daniel served all of the kings of Babylon for 70 years. He might have been, I don't know, 17, 20 years old, who knows? For 70 years, he served many kings. The kings came and went. You know who stayed? Daniel. Daniel outlasted the kings. Daniel. Empires rose and fell. Guess who was there? Daniel. Speaking to the kings on behalf of God Almighty. I kind of wondered, did Babylon conquer Israel? Or did Israel conquer Babylon? from the inside out. I kind of wonder. I think God's a mastermind. And God said, I'm going to conquer Babylon, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. And Daniel served in the court, speaking the word of God to a foreign heathen nation. He would rise up in boldness and speak to the kings, thus saith the Lord. I know you can say that in Israel. Try saying that in Babylon. For some, somehow, some way, Daniel did. Because maybe Israel conquered Babylon from the inside out. That sounds like my God. Does it sound like your God? It sounds like my God. Yeah, it does. Take note of a few things. Number one, take note of the gentleman, the, 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 the guy that was in charge of the steward, if you will, of the young men. His name was Ashpenaz. I'm going to try to say that again. Ashfanaz. Ashfanaz. Can you say that? I wonder. So I'd say that with me. Ashfanaz. Get okay, somebody. Ashfanaz. Yeah, you all sound as silly as I do. Ash. <laughs> I thought you would. That's why. <laughs> Ashfanaz. He was the one in charge. You know what his name means? Hmm. His name means I will make prominent the sprinkled. Because these four were sprinkled with the oil, with the anointing. He says, I will make prominent the anointed. And I do believe that God is giving a part two from last night. He says, I anoint you. But now he says to you this morning, I will make prominent the anointing, the anointed. I will make you prominent. I will cause you to rise up. I will cause you to be acknowledged. I will cause you to be seen. I will cause you to be sought out. Because I will make prominent the anointed. And for some reason, Scripture tells us that these four young men, they had favor with Ashfanaz. Remember his name? Ashfanaz. I bet you you're going to be saying that name all week long. <laughs> Ashfanaz. <laughs> Ashfanaz. Uh-huh. I will make prominent the anointed. And I believe that God is speaking to us from last night, he says, now I will make you prominent. I am going to put you in positions of authority, maybe seemingly positions of captivity. Because the next thing I want to share with you is this. It says, God brought them to the land of Shinar. 
to Babylon, seemingly as captives, but God brought them there to save them. God brought Israel to Babylon, to the world, if you will, to save them. And it seems as if he brought them in captivity. Sometimes we think that we are in captivity. We don't know who we are, why we are, what's going on. Sometimes when you go to your jobs every day, you would swear you're in captivity. If I got to go to that job one more time, you would swear that you are slaves to your bosses, slaves to your jobs, slaves to that paycheck. But maybe, just maybe, God is doing something glorious. He is in disguise bringing you into the world, if you will, seemingly as captives so you can save them all. And you know that we believe that with all of our hearts. I believe that God sends each and every one of you into your daily place, whatever it might be, to save them. And I know sometimes you think that you're going there to be diligent and to work and to make a living and get a paycheck, but that's not why God sent them. They are not captives and neither are you. You are not a captive to the world. You are not a captive to your job. You are not a captive to that paycheck. God sent you there. You are not in bondage. God can pull you from that place anytime he wants. Has he ever? Oh, yes, he has. He has. But he sends you there incognito. Sometimes you don't even know that he sent you there. But he sent you there. Why? To save them. Not to become as them. Not to become as them. When Israel was taken captive into Babylon, they were not to become as the Babylonians, but they were to maintain who they were. It says that when they went there, that, that they, he gave them all new names and titles. Right? As soon as they went into the world, they were given new names. You ever go into the world and get a title? Well, I'm chief assistant uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the second in command, of the third in charge, of the... I don't know, everybody wants a title. <laughs> uh, no one can say that, oh, you know, I, I run the cash register. I am a chief, chief associate of uh, <laughs> goods and services. No one can say I'm an accounts receivable or, uh, no, <laughs> I am the executive decision maker of uh, Warehouse 3 and Building 4. <laughs> and that's okay. But it seems like they went into the world and they all got new titles. And God says this, that's not your identity. I say this with all my heart. It is not your identity. Your identity is not the titles the world gives you. Not the titles they give you, not the office they give you, not the, 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 the position they give you. It is not it. We are deceived when we think that you are the children of God upon the earth and God sent you in there to save them all. And that the children of God, they would not accept the names. I, will, I don't accept your title. I'll put it on there, whatever. You want me to wear this? Fine. You want to call me by this? Fine. It's not who I am. I'm better than that. I'm greater than that. I am the child of God. I am a servant of the Most High God. You are ten times better than any badge and any name and any title anything in this world could ever give you. Don't you know it? Don't you know it? We'll spend our, our whole lives, our afternoons, our lunches talking about our titles and positions. They do not give you identity. Your jobs don't give you identity. Your education does not give you identity. Some of us have, have titles for our jobs. Some of us don't, you know. And sometimes we want to seek it, but God says, man, seek me. Can you hear that? Do you see that? Do you feel that? I, I believe that God is opening us up to, to, the, to this understanding. It says that he gives us understanding greater than all of the world. Yes. Uh, we got something better. And we don't know it. We think that we're captives in this world system. And we're grateful for the title that we get. And God says reject it. Because your title is far greater. And you might have been sent in there as a slave, but you are no slave. The only slave you are is to God Almighty. Amen. They changed the name of, of, of Daniel. They gave him the name Belteshazzar, which means that their God, Bel, is the one who protects them. His name meant that the foreign God protected Daniel. But you know what Daniel's name really meant? It, it meant, it's, his, his name means God judges me. And therefore he was afraid of no one and nothing. When he would go and finally appear before the kings, all of the other of Babylon's, uh, the magicians, the enchanters, they would fear before King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar would have a dream, and he wouldn't even know what the dream meant. Do you remember? And he would call all his enchanters, say, come to me and tell me what my dream meant. And they were all scared to death. 
We better tell this king something or he's going to kill us. He even knew that they were weak-minded. He says, I'm not telling you my dream. Because if I tell you my dream, you're going to give me some false interpretation. And I won't know. So he said, I want you to tell me my dream and then tell me the interpretation. Then I can believe you, you bunch of liars. <laughs> but they were all scared. They were scared for their lives. It's not us. We are the people of God. It is not the, the, the lords of this world that protect us. It is God Almighty who is our judge. And, and Daniel would stand before King Nebuchadnezzar. And he'd say, I come before you not as your servant. I come before you as servant of the Most High God. He went in there with boldness and said, I will tell you your dream. And I will tell you the interpretation of your dream. But just hold on a second. First, let me tell you who I am. I am not Belteshazzar. I am Daniel. And it is only God who judges me. And I serve him and him alone. And I fear no man. You give me nothing. You don't give me titles. You don't give me position. You don't give me identity. You don't give me prominence in this life. I am a servant of God. And I have come to save you and your whole stinking nation. <laughs> you may call me Belteshazzar. As a matter of fact, after Daniel interpreted a few of the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar would write his memoirs. And you know how he would revert to Belteshazzar? He would refer to him as Daniel. Amen. He was the one that gave him Belteshazzar, but he wouldn't call him by that name because he knew that's not who he was. He knew it when that boy stood in his court that this boy is not of this earth. And he is not here because I brought him here. He is here because God sent him to save me. Amen. And I'm sure he was eager to be in the presence of Daniel. Daniel was not eager to be in the presence of Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't want to stand before bosses and managers and presidents and whoever they think they are. He didn't care. He knew he stood before God. And that no matter whose presence you are in during the course of a day, whatever title they have and whatever title you think you have, you are a servant of God. And it is only God who judges you. And you fear no man. And you speak the word of God with absolute conviction. And if you have fear, it is only fear of God. And you say, Nebuchadnezzar, hang on, I'll get to your story in a second. Let me tell you a few things. And he'd chat with him for a while. And then he says, okay, now about your dream, let me tell you your dream. And he'd tell him the dream and then tell him the definition of his dream. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Did Babylon conquer Israel? Or did Israel conquer Babylon? Well. Who are we and why are we in this world? Why does God cause you to be captives if you think in your daily routines? Because you're captives? Or because you're saviors? Daniel knew why. Amen? Amen. Do you? Do you? Do you know why you stand before you who you stand before? Because they have something to give you? Because you have something to give them. There were times when Daniel would come before him. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. He says, if you interpret this thing, I will give you a better position. I'll make you manager of the Southeast Quadrant, whatever. I'll give you a nice car, a nice house. I'll give you whatever. Belshazzar said, keep it. Give it to somebody else. But I will